little bit about this project and then hand over to my colleague Sam, who is the poet and going to lead us through the exercises. Um, but anyway, a really well, a warm welcome to this Poetry for Wellbeing workshop. This has been a project with the Scottish Poetry Library with also with SASWA. We got some Scottish government funding to run a series of Poetry for Wellbeing workshops last year and to create a Poetry for Wellbeing toolkit. Um, so I assume George will send people these slides, but you can see in the slides there's a link to the the toolkit and it basically gives you workshop plans to run six of your own with ideas about poems to read and share, writing exercises, um, a little bit of kind of theory about why we're doing this. Um, and I guess it's it's really coming out of a, the, the funding we got is coming out of a workforce well-being funding pot that the Scottish government had set aside. And of course, Ariane Critchley and I both being qualified social workers and trying to keep grounded in practice, recognize that probably the thing that would help well-being the most is to have better pay and conditions and smaller uh, workloads. But having said all that, um, there are also things that bring us joy and pleasure and connection. And for Ariane and I, um, poetry has been part of our practice in teaching social work and also in connecting um, during the pandemic with social workers throughout the country. We ran different workshops um, around using poetry for practice. Um, so that's where the work comes from. I work at the University of Edinburgh. Um, if you're interested in poetry, there's a slide at the end of poetry and social work. Please get in touch with myself or with Ariane, who's at the University of Stirling, and we'd be really happy to connect with you. We're, we're, we're thinking about running some more workshops in the coming academic year, if anybody's interested. Um, and just also to say, um, the reason I put this Billy Collins poem up. So Billy Collins is a, an American poet that I really love. I'm from the United States myself. And he and it's a, from a poem introduction to poetry. Walk inside the poem's rooms and feel the walls for a light switch. And for me, it captured something about how poetry helps me see things differently. It brings lightness. Um, sometimes it brings darkness, but in a kind of strange, comforting way. Um, so you're very, very welcome. And I'm now going to hand over to um, Dr. Samuel Tung, who's here from the Scottish Poetry Library, who's been a close collaborator on this project. And we're really honoured to have him here today to help us with this workshop. Um, it's over to you, Sam. Thanks, Autumn. Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to um, this session on Poetry for Wellbeing. Um, what we're going to do today, uh, we'll do a couple of exercises, but we'll also have um, a reading of a poem to get uh, a sense of why and how poetry can um, become a kind of creative intervention um, in your own work, but also for your own um, well-being and mental health, uh, which is incredibly important. And poetry has been proven uh, to help with those those elements where yeah you can read and write a poem and that will um, that it's not magic it's not a magic uh, fix but it can help with um, ranting or expressing or um, trying to work through a problem it's a very reflective mode as well so we're going to um, have a look at some of those ways of thinking about it today um, in terms of having an introduction so yeah, I am Sam Tung from the, I'm the projects coordinator at the Scottish Poetry Library and Autumn and Ariane and I have been working on this um, for a long, a wee while now. Yeah, it feels like quite a while and um, the, it's come to fruition in the uh, running your own poetry for wellbeing workshop. So I do um, advise you to have a look at that when you can. But what we're going to do, we're going to rather than go around the room and introduce ourselves um, formally, we're going to write uh, an instant name poem as an introductory exercise and then we can go around and share those so that we can get to know one another um you always in a, any of these kinds of workshops and with any of these exercises it's lovely to hear your voice and to share what you've written but of course you also have the right to not share and to um, uh, and and you don't have to share anything that you don't feel comfortable with so um this is our introductory exercise the instant name poem so hopefully uh, you have some kind of writing implement with you, whether that's your laptop or a um, piece of paper and a pen. And what I would say with this one is 
um, to work your work your way through it. Um, it's fairly self-explanatory, but um, don't think too much about it, if that makes sense. Um, it's just a yeah, it's a warm up. It's to get the the post lunch juices flowing um, and just work your way through the, the 10 points um, and have fun with it. That's the main aim of it as well. Don't be too don't be too stressed about uh, it's not an exam. It's literally just kind of um, filling this in uh, and seeing how it works. So in, with that, I'm going to actually time it. I'm going to add a timer so that that will uh, hopefully force you to not uh, go too far off piste and um, uh, kind of structure it a bit more and streamline it a bit more. So I'm going to give you, let's think about this, uh, six minutes. OK, I'm going to give you six minutes to fill this in. Uh, and see how this works for you. And also, don't worry if you don't get something for every single every single point. But this is just a kind of fun way of thinking about how we describe ourselves in our world. OK, right. I'm going to set the timer for six minutes. And then if I can find it on here, yes, I can. There it is. OK, six minutes. You've got six minutes to fill in this instant name poem. OK. Any problems, just give us a shout in the chat. I've set the timer, off you go. If you've just joined us, we're just quickly doing this instant name poem. So you just follow the prompts on each line that are on the slide. We're we're almost finished, but you might be able to do it really quick. <laughs> <laughs> Three minutes to go. Mm -hmm.
Okay, a minute left. Okay, we've got five, four, three, two, one, full stop or semicolon or dot, dot, dot. Whichever is the most appropriate to where you where you finished. Um, yeah, hopefully that was surprising for you, but also um, kind of linked into some uh, interesting thoughts and thought processes that you might be going through right now or that you've got memories of. Um, but it's a way of just playing with um yeah the kind of with your name but also with um where you're coming from so i wonder if if there's people willing to share in the group as a way of introducing themselves that would be fabulous um let me just check george can people unmute themselves yeah they should be able to great okay so if there's anybody who would like to share um by unmuting themselves and um, introducing themselves through their poem. I, I'm happy to go first just <laughs> to give people a chance. I can be exposed Excellent. first if you want, Sam. Thanks, Autumn. OK, so. Um, right, Autumn, it means a season of change. It is the number 47. It is like light through leaves. It is like kisses on your cheek. It is a memory of Beverly, who always told the truth, even when it was hard to hear. My name is Autumn. It means give love. Lovely. That's a really, yeah, that's a really lovely way of um, unpacking a name or packing new things into it as well. Yeah. What I love, I've done this lots of times now because it's <laughs> one of the exercises in our workshop pack. And what I love yeah. is every time it's different, depending on how I'm feeling, what memory comes yeah. up. Yeah. And it's really yeah. powerful to write the name of somebody who you who you really love, who taught you something and to read it out as always gives me a little bit of a. Yeah, a feel. <laughs> yeah, a jolt. yeah, it gives you that jolt. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a it's capacious enough to um to fit in fit things in as to where you are, and it's interesting if you repeat it um a few times and see where you're at um on any given day. Yeah, mm. does anyone else fancy sharing what they came up with? If you broke the rules, that's absolutely fine. Poetry is also about breaking the rules. They're, they're, oh, Yasmin, I was yeah, going to say they're holding silence really well. Well done, <laughs> Yasmin, for putting your hand up. <laughs> OK, so. Uh, uh, Yasmin, it means jasmine flower. It is the number six. It is like a comforting color in the form of lotus. It is like perfumes and memories. It is being contented and making the most of our situations for the betterment of others. It is living life with this value coming from humble roots to grow and prosper. I mean, my name is Yasmin. It means give me kindness in my family. Oh, lovely. Yeah, that was, and using really long sentences like that it really helps as well because it um, starts to just kind of spin out into a real narrative as well. Um, a kind of biographical detail in there. Thanks, Yasmin. That's really interesting. Mm. Thank you. Anyone else fancy it? I really want to bully Graham into doing it, but that wouldn't be very fair. That's not very ethical. <laughs> That's not very ethical, no. <laughs> it's not. It's terrible. 
Oh, Natasha. Oh, Natasha. <laughs> I, I, I think I'm too shallow for this exercise, I'm afraid. <laughs> The, the, the people who have been significant to me haven't taught me particularly useful values. <laughs> <laughs> but Natasha's willing to go. Natasha, do you want to? Yeah, I'll go. Um, I did right. cheat a bit because I did actually Google what my name meant. So that bit is a bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's fair Natasha, it means the Lord's birthday. It is the number four. It is like sunshine. It is like traveling with my parents to New York. It is a memory of my mum who taught me to always be myself and did this through her empathy shown to others. My name is Natasha. It means always be kind. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, I love that detail of the traveling to New York as well. It's really lovely when a, a poem or a piece of writing has got that real concrete detail in there that we can relate to as well. Um, yeah, and makes it unusual. Yeah, that's great. That's really nice. Thanks, Natasha. And it's it's not cheating googling what your name might mean. It's um quite an, another way of kind of um, playing with um, connotations and and ways in which your which names can have meaning. I think it's it's good it's good to start. It's not cheating. There's no cheating. Yeah, well, I learned something new because I didn't know it meant that until about five. Years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's good to know. Shirley, you got your hand up. My name is Shirley. It means loyal, wise, and good. It's like the sea. Floating in the sea. In the Italian sun. It's a memory of snort wing in the Caribbean. Traditional love is priceless. It's available. I'm sorry, Shirley. Would you be able to read it again? Just um, I lost you, lost you at the final bit there. Oh, sorry. Yeah, your really your sound. Yeah, that's uh, brilliant. Yeah. That's Can a lot you do better. it again? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> no worries. My name is Shirley. It means loyal, wise, and deep. It is the number two. It is like the sea, floating in the sea in the Italian sun. It's a memory of snorkeling in the Caribbean. Unconditional love is priceless, always available, always caring. My name is Shirley. It means the journey is more important than the destination. Great. That's a great final line as well. And that concrete detail again is lovely. Um, yeah, that really works. That really works. It's a nice way of introducing each other as well, because um, I'm now just going to link Shirley with snorkeling in the Caribbean, which is not a bad thing to, to be linked with. <laughs> That's lovely. Anyone else? We can have shallow ones, Graham. Sometimes those are surprisingly deep. <laughs> Not taking the bait. Sorry, I can't okay. help my whole self, Sam. It won't right. be on you. The complaint <laughs> will be about me, not about. <laughs> yeah. Even my name is shallow. It means man from the grey land. Doesn't it? <laughs> that's, not, that's kind of mysterious, man from the grey land. No, no, it means, far, it means farmer. In old oh, Irish does it? <laughs> we wouldn't have any food without farmers. I come yeah. from a farming background and the farmers are very important, I have to say. If, yeah. if, I, if, I, if I was doing the farming, you wouldn't have any food. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have do you have one, Graham? Or you, I don't know, need... sorry. Right. Yeah. No worries, no worries. <laughs> That's cool. OK, I might, I'll read mine. Um, yeah. My name is Samuel. It means heard by God and seals and burnt light. It is the number eight. It is like the colour of frosted grass. It is like the end of term. It is a memory of my grandfather's hands and the way he built teepees for runner beans. My name is Sam. It means I shall always be listening. It was interesting when we were when we we're hearing people's um, name poems there, how much caring was a real key part of all of them, actually. Everybody mentioned care um, and part of when um, Autumn and Ariane uh, came to the Poetry Library and were talking about um, setting up this toolkit um, and thinking about poetry as a, as a, a way of um, intervening in, in mental health and well-being, is that the caring professions um, are so, it's so difficult to care for yourself. You're caring for others all of the time um, and to take time out to care for yourself and to look after yourself in that way. Um, is really, really important. And I, it just struck me as as I was listening to everybody how much um, care and love and all those elements 
um, were in your names, uh, in the names that you had written down. So that's something to very much be aware of and um, and think with, I think. Okay, if we if anyone else wants to share, this is the moment. It's also fine if you don't, that's fine. Okay, so that's a kind of um, a bit of a warm up to start thinking about how um, the, yeah, the kind of physical and mental act of sitting down uh, and writing, you can start to um, unpack some of the things that are going on in your lives and in your professions uh, and in your working life and see how that all interacts. Um, so the, the next poem that we were going to look at, i um, hoping Autumn can read this for us as well, um, is this poem um, called Reading the Safeguarding and Child Protection Policy by Susanna Hart. I wonder uh, when you see that title, what does the title, uh, we'll look at the poem in a minute, um, but what does the title do? What does it signify to you? And you just unmute and, and just shout in. Not a poem. <laughs> exactly. Yes. It's a, yeah. What what language? What kind of language is it? Prose. Yeah. Yeah. Reading the safeguarding and child protection policy. Yeah. It's good, definitely got that sense of um. It's a funny. It's a funny title for a poem. Um, but maybe hinting at how the poet is going to um, deal with the content. Um, but I'll open this up. So hopefully you can uh, see it. Let's check. You can on, also, yeah, yeah, you can yeah. also um, click on it in your browser. Yeah. Participants can just open it in their own browser if they want, if you're having trouble, Sam. Yeah, that's a good idea. Can people just click on that so they can see the poem? If you want to follow along with the words. Well, I'll get <clears> them <throat> to read it aloud and then we'll just have a yeah. brief uh, discussion about how it um, affected you personally um, and thinking about how poetry can um, operate in this in this space between um, your um, professional life and, and personal life. OK. OK. So so it's Reading the Safeguarding and Child Protection Policy by Susanna Hart. Has left me feeling vaguely sick, and I think a walk is probably the answer, is often said to be the answer, though I now understand physical intervention must not be take, undertaken lightly, and the appropriate training must be given because the policy is designed to prevent the impairment of health or development, even though it has had the opposite effect on me, as currently I feel impaired, uneven, unequal to the task of being real, such that it occurs to me that humankind seems to be trying to find ever more ingenious ways to make the bearing of reality more difficult, else how could anyone have thought of all the horrible things that someone somewhere is doing to someone else whose vulnerabilities may or may not include neglect, homelessness, mental health issues, bereavement, previous abuse. But then again, humankind has form for this kind of thing. As medieval warfare, I seem to recall was rather brutal and the skeletons exhumed from mass battle graves show hacking injuries, great gouges on the bones from mace and broadsword. And to be fair, that documentary on Vietnam that, we've, that we're watching on catch up may not go heavy on the suffering caused by female genital, genital mutilation or child sexual exploitation, but it's pretty full on when it comes to napalm. And furthermore, the museum in Hiroshima strongly implied that the devil has always had his hands full with party tricks and pranks, which leads me to ask myself whether any good will come of all this knowledge, as in point of fact the policy suggests that the imagery should only be viewed on a strictly necessary and need-to-know basis, and certainly I did not need to know about the buttons burned into the skin or the flesh hanging off the wrists. But now I do know and I cannot cease to know, while perhaps more usefully, I also know what to do if a child discloses. And I recognize that this takes a lot of courage 
And then I cannot stop paying attention because beforehand the child may show signs of anger and sadness and bruising silence. They may wear long sleeves in, in, at, in, at inappropriate times. Their lives may be particularly vulnerable, more transient, chaotic, and unsupported than lives in general. And they may feel guilty, scared, and as if they have lost all trust in adults. And indeed, when you think about it, who could blame them? Thanks so much, Autumn. Yeah, that was um, a very powerful reading of it. And you could sense one, well, I could definitely sense one as you were reading it, Autumn, this, it's really um in terms of punctuation and in terms of structure and in terms of a poem it's just full on isn't it it's just all of that information um and horror really that comes at you um and difficult to read i imagine as well yeah, yeah. it took me it just takes me back to things in practice mm. um and i remember vividly actually being newly qualified and yeah, just feeling almost like an onslaught of terrible stories that everyone around me and the, the team that I was in seemed to think were perfect, like normal because they were day to day, you know, and that you kind of get used to it over time. But yeah, it's um, a reminder of what it's like to just the onslaught of that when you're when it's all new to you. Yeah. How did um, other people in the in the group um, feel as they were hearing the poem or did it? Uh, resonate with some of your experiences or um, were you thinking whether is is this a poem or yeah what were your thoughts as you were listening? Yeah Shirley go for it. We've um, changed the way yeah I've got my mic on this time we've yeah. changed the way we write our case notes so um, we write them to the children now wow. so that if they access their files then the story is to them so it it makes us think much more about our language and obviously in line with the promise and things like that so it was interesting to look back at some of the the words or how we um, share information or, or how we might have it within reports um so um yeah it it's funny when you compare and contrast perhaps maybe uh, the heaviness of what we did before to where we are now. Oh, that's really, that's fascinating. Yeah, as a, obviously as a, uh, I'm not in the in social work profession, but that's really interesting just in terms of language use. Yeah. And when you're saying you're writing to the children rather than describing the situation in those in the way that this poem that I read without that experience, um, it did feel like it was kind of um, heavy on the description and heavy on the um, answering to the policy uh, of how to how to respond but that's really interesting that if you were to rewrite this now um or if Susanna Hart was to rewrite this now the policy would have changed and so the language would hopefully change a bit as well that's fascinating yeah we'll have to we'll email her and say rewrite it now with the new policy in mind with new policies there anyone else how did they how did it um affect you as you were as you were listening I think not everything is negative all the time, although sometimes it feels a bit like that. Uh -huh. we, we, we haven't changed our way of recording, but I've previously, I think, because you only record significant things, they've mostly been the bad things that have happened. Right. And now, right, right. And now if I'm out with young people and they've done something nice or something kind, I always make a point of writing up a case note. So if they are reading that when they're older, they'll be yeah, reminded yeah, yeah. of something nice that they did. That's really, that's really interesting as well. So that's, yeah, so thinking about, I suppose it's thinking about how writing in general, yeah, obviously you're writing up your professional case notes and stuff, but when you think, if you were to think of it as a, as a poem or as something, as a, an aid memoir or as something that will be revisited in the future, it's really interesting to think about the kind of language, the kind of adjectives, the kind of um, emotive language that is used. Um, yeah, and I suppose some of the part of the point of what, um, of these workshops and thinking about this is to also think about how language affects the communication of those um, those elements and not to make poems out of people's very serious case notes. That's not what I'm suggesting, but just thinking about how if they were poems, what what you would want included or what you would want to um, uh, to be communicated into the future about that. 
OK, was there anyone else who just wanted to raise an, a, a raise a point or a, a sense of their um, listening to that poem or reading it before? How it affected you? There are no wrong answers. Doesn't mean there are any right ones either. It's, a... <laughs> <laughs> it's poetry. It's poetry. Don't worry. <laughs> OK, well, we've got one um, exercise that kind of links which well, it links with this sense of um, different types of language and ways in which um, you can, again, um, play a little bit with how you represent your own experience, um, but also how you find your subjecthood, your selfhood in the midst of these of kind of policy documents or um, officialdom, um, which can get very overbearing uh, and can get and you can lose that kind of empathetic subject to it at the, in the middle of all of this, um, uh, in the middle of all of this kind of um, corporate speak, I suppose. Um, so this one that we're going to look at, uh, this is quite a long poem. Um, Caleb Femi uh, it comes from his collection Poor. Um, and we'd, we'd probably, we might not read all of it because of, I, mean, I know we're short of time, but it's just to have a look at it as an example of how to play with two different kind of styles of language um, and see how this might be somewhere where you can insert yourself and insert your own ideas. So I think what we'll do, I'll read a little bit of the poem. Um, and if you click on that, yeah, if you click on that link, you'll be able to see it. Um, and I'll read, I'll read um, a few, a uh, few lines from it, a kind of section from it, and then we'll move on to our final uh, exercise and see how how we uh, again can play with the language. So this one's called uh, "A Designer Talks of a Home, A Resident Talks of a Home." We spend 87% of our lives inside buildings. I was conceived within these walls in '87. How they are designed really affects how we feel. The wallpaper was here before me. I don't claim it. How we behave. Mum says this is a good home. When I was little, I used to peel the yellow from the wallpaper. Design is not just a visual thing. It's a thought process. Once I swallowed an apple pip and a guy from the 12th floor told me it's a skill. An apple tree will grow, grow out from my belly. Design is a tool to enhance our humanity, a frame for life. Does that mean I'll be the first tree boy on the estate? Putting the human experience at the beginning of the process. The guy said trees live as long as boys do here. That's why we have concrete. Tactile memory. At the back of our block, there is a wall full of RIPs, a thousand unlived lives of boys and trees. Empathy is the cornerstone of design. You know, the architect that designed this estate killed himself. It's all about showmanship and theatricality. Mum reckons that's why they covered the rot with cladding. It's about how things feel and smell as much as how they look, because concrete smells like a siege. When it rains, I like to imbue people with a sense of well-being, empowerment, gentle joyfulness. Pretend I live. Translate the future life of a building into design language on the 19th floor. You can see everything but the future. So that's um, the kind of first half of the poem exercise. And you could get a sense there of um, how Caleb is playing with the two um, registers, I suppose, uh, that there's the documentary evidence of the uh, architect, how they've designed the home, the lived space, the urban space. Um, but then how it is to actually live within that urban space, that designed space. Um, and there's that kind of conflict or um, tension between the two. And what we were going to look at in this in this next one, and I'll give you um, a good amount of time to, to play with this a bit more, um, is to um, look at the document. I'll share this screen. I'll share this. Um, so that you've got it in front of you as well. Um, so what we're going we, to look we at. We also emailed it yeah, out. So Saz, we yeah. should have emailed you both the Caleb Femi poem and the, the SSSC extract in yeah. the Word document. Yeah. 
So I'll bring up, if you haven't got it in front of you, I'll bring up the um, SSSC document uh, code of conduct extract um, for you now. And we'll have 10, yeah, we'll have 10 minutes on this where we, um, yeah, just insert your own ideas into, so split, split the paragraphs up. Let's have a quick, I'll stop the share and then I will um, share this one. Just so I can see it there as well. That should be that one. Yeah, can you see? Yeah, you can see that. Okay. Yep. Um, so yeah, where you see those lines, those bullet points, uh, respond after each line. Put yourself in there. Um, this isn't going to be. Uh, yeah, don't worry about it. It's not a confessional in that sense. If you've broken the code of conduct in these ways, um, it's not going to be um, uh, recorded in that sense. It's just that we're playing with this way of how do you put your 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 own self back into um, a kind of official document like this. So um, basically, what I'm what we're asking you to do is uh, respond. Uh, to each line and put yourself in there. So meet relevant standards of practice and work in a lawful, safe and effective way. What does that mean to you? So yeah, what does this mean? What does this mean to work in an effective way? Um, and what does this mean to you? So yeah, respond. There's um, six, we've got 10 there, I think. Yeah, so we'll, um, we'll have 10 minutes of just play. Yeah, just play with it. Don't worry too much about it again but just use it as a way of um, thinking about how you integrate these points into your, into your practice. Um, and it, it might just be as well that an image comes up yeah. or a fragment of a memory that's triggered by the line in some way. It's that bit about kind of the call and response that Caleb does yeah. between here's what the designer said, but here's something from the life of people living on the estate. So that's what the SSSC says we've got to do as social workers. But actually, what's our lived experience or what what fragments from our practice or from us as just human beings kind of feel called in some way to respond to those lines? It doesn't have to make sense. It doesn't have to be no, a no, full no. sentence, does it? It can just be... Yeah, so it's it, it's not like we're actually asking you to do your purdle, <laughs> your purdle justification of additional hours and stuff. It's it's more kind of free flowing than that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yes, it's not official. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, try and have fun with it, I guess. <laughs> yeah, go for it. So we'll have uh, we'll have eight minutes on it because I'm, I'm aware again of time and I want to leave time for sharing. So I'll set the timer for eight minutes and just yeah. Just respond to those calls.
couple more minutes on that. Don't worry if you don't have a response to all 10 points. Okay, that's that's your lot on that one. I just wanted to ask the question: um, How did you feel to try and uh, rewrite or respond to professional texts? How did that feel? Shelley, yeah. Sorry, I thought you'd done. I start. Yeah, well, I started off responding professionally and then uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. with your prompts or whoever was typing then started to think a bit more fluidly that's interesting yeah so there was that immediate kind of gut reaction to want to respond as you say professionally but then it yeah it could flow from there how what, did you have any uh, lines that you'd like to share a 6.7 Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I had in free fall a formation team is best. Oh, nice. So if I read, so I'll read that recognize and respect the roles and expertise of workers from other professions and work in partnership with them. And your response was in free fall, a formation team is best because I often use a right. illustration with kids that everybody's got their hands and feet. Nice, nice. I like that. In free fall, formation is best. Lovely. Anyone else? Uh, I had to that to that one. I had um, for the same one six point second uh, seven. Um, recognize and respect the rules and expertise of workers from other professions and work in partnership with them. The team leader rolls her eyes at another referral from that home visitor. Okay, yes. <laughs> <laughs> putting some flesh on the bones of um, real life experience. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it was funny how loads of things, memories started to come up actually. Yeah. Did anyone else have any uh, other lines that that affected that they could um, write a response with? Yasmin, yeah. Uh, I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna paste them. I'm just gonna paste. 
in the chat. Just, just kind of like, I just took them all and put them in the one one list. Ah, okay. So that's in the chat. You've got that in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. Admin is your friend in the long term. I like that. <laughs> so these are the responses to the point. Yeah. Nice. So you've got the long, yeah. Some of those feel like kind of a, shor a shorthand, like you got to almost sometimes a professional language, you've got to translate it into a way that makes sense to you. Yeah. So I feel like you've done an interesting job of that with those, Yasmin. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. I know we've we've only got five minutes left or so, but um was there any other lines that people felt particularly moved to respond to? I had put something for point six, point ten. Yeah. Um, read, the, yeah, read the point and then um, read yours yeah yeah so that's listen to feedback from people who use services caters and other relevant people and consider that feedback to improve my practice um and i'd put it's the trying that is often most remembered nice mm. oh, i like that it's the trying that it's often the most remembered yeah yeah that's I, ha I had one for that one too actually so um i had when I leave the team, you give me a small bottle of perfume and thank me for helping your son. Hmm. So it just brought up a memory of like, well, how, what form does feedback come in? Do you know, yeah. you know, sometimes it's or people getting you, you know, making you. I remember one person just making me a really special cup of coffee. <laughs> it sounds, you know, like. She bought like a special instant coffee and making that for me. And that felt like a bit of a like. Yeah, anyway, this this bits of feedback that are that are kind of. Not in words, really. Yeah. That's a really nice point, actually. So, yeah, for going forward with this, if, if people want to go forward with the um, uh, the kind of responses to the official policy calls and things like that is to record those things for your own your own well-being yeah Re record those moments where somebody makes you a really special cup of coffee and you know that that seems to be just a kind of moment in time but a lot has led up to that um and a poem um or a kind of response to putting yourself back into those lines of um, policy it means yeah you you know where you are you're doing the right things you're um that instant feedback is really important it's a nice way of recording it um, and also, I think the ambiguity of practice, too, of like mm -hmm. some things are um, like I had one around self-care about crying at the photocopier and a colleague mm -hmm. giving me a hug, like the dark things or the ambiguous moments or the kind of there's something quite comforting and giving yourself a space to record those, too. And um, yeah, or for me anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wonder what uh, another uh, not giving you homework. I know you're all very, very busy people, but um, maybe you could almost bring those two pieces that we've been writing about together. So you could do the um, the kind of poetic explorations of your name and then um, put in how you then you could kind of merge the, the call and response pieces that you've been writing as well. You could kind of put those together. And I think that would come up with um, a really interesting um poem a really interesting single piece of writing if you merge these two together and the thing is always with with these tasks is just to play uh they can be um you can share them with people or you can just have them as a kind of solo piece of reflective um writing when you have five minutes um yeah uh and that's really uh, there's the there's six there's six sessions in the poetry for well-being workshops which are on the screen now um, and we host on the Poetry Library website. Um, they are designed um, for groups to use, but you can certainly use them on your own as well uh, and use them as kind of creative um, uh, explorations and ways of reflecting on where you're at just now. Um, and hopefully you'll find some use in them. Autumn, do you want to just... Um, yeah, just... 
Sure, yeah, thank you, Sam, and thanks for coming. If you're interested in taking part in other Poetry for Wellbeing workshops or you think you might want to run a group yourself and you want to have a chat with somebody about it, you can email me. I'm Autumn Resh Marsh or you can email my colleague Ariane Critchley. Um, we'd be happy to hear from you. Um, yeah, I think go to where you find comfort and solace and joy and we all need that especially in social work because it is not always an easy job although I take Graham's point that there's lots of good stuff in there too that we don't always kind of notice enough um but thank you and I hope you have a really good rest of your your conference thanks everybody thanks